so so far actually we have been discussing what is inside a microprocessor i'm sure i hope everyone is comfortable now what is inside a microprocessor the alus the registers the memory units the programming of uh, it basically the assembly language which is sort of an interface between your hardware and the high level language so we have covered everything and hopefully the lab exercises helped you in getting comfortable with it. now it's a time to slightly start looking outside how shall a microprocessor communicate with another microprocessor for example or a sensor for an example so that's what we are exactly going into so before going into that before going into the first of that basically the general purpose input output of the gpio let me take a step back i have told this many times in the class but just want to reiterate it again a microprocessor unit actually is a memory based system right everything is memory based you store the code in memory you store the data in memory and similarly it is extended to the interfacing part also for a microprocessor interfacing looks like a memory arrangement so how does it work how does it look like let's actually deep dive so typically the input output or the interfacing part of a microprocessor they call it as memory mapped input output so this is uh, uh, the reason why it is adopted because it's a simple and more convenient way because uh, when you plug in a device the device will access a set of certain memory the microprocessor will also access the same memory and that is a communication link between the input output and the micro processor so it makes it very simple to do so typically as i said how it happens each device actually is registered as a memory address for the micro processor so uh, in that case if it is like a memory then you can go ahead and use the typical cpu load and store instructions that you are quite comfortable by now right so you used to store data to memory you used to read data from memory the same commands can be used the only change that you have to do is basically the location that you are going to read or write those locations are actually mapped to an input and output that is a beauty about it so if you see here you can see over here so this is a typical memory map a typical register map of a peripheral device some memory locations here the address of those locations are specified here and then this is a register which is a 32 bit register so this for, for this instance just for the illustration part of it this is a data output register so whatever value i will write to this register will actually reflect in this general purpose input output provided it is acting as an output if it is an input this guy the gpio will write something onto this output register and that can be read by a microprocessor so the entire operation let's say i want to simply do something like a write operation so currently this is this gpio is configured as an output so what the microprocessor core which is nothing but the alu part or the coding part will do is it will store some data to this particular register that will get reflected in the output this will be a pin at the uh, output side which will reflect like something like this let's say the initial uh, time it is zero the output was zero you write something here so that it becomes high so this is how it looks like so for a microprocessor unit it will read and write to a memory uh, location and that memory location is actually connected to a peripheral device that's why it is typically known as a memory mapped input output okay so we'll see in much more detail how does it work so if you see here this is this we have seen many times and i just want to again reiterate it here so the memory map of in this case this is a, this is specifically for cortex m0 plus that we are going to deal with so this 4 gb of memory space basically 512 plus 512 becomes 1 gb then this 512 plus this 512 another 1 gb so totally 2 gb then another 1 gb 3 gb and another 1 gb 4 gb so totally 4 gb of space and the manufacturer so the vendor has helped us in dividing it into this uh, uh, certain reserved regions for each type of code or data and this is just to help us obviously you can go ahead and change this but generally we won't do that we'll just take as it is so the code space occupies some 512 mb space from the region 0x all zeros to 0x1 all x okay so this specify the code and this actually is 
something like a flash memory where you can actually program it but moment the system is executing you cannot see it right it's a flash memory so typically this is read only because you can only uh, write it during the pre uh, the, the burning part the pre program part but once done we can't really uh, write it during the execution part then we have the sram where it is mostly the read write memory and typically it is reserved for data sometimes we use it for call also and this is the range that it comes in it's another 520 you can think of then you have the peripheral region so so far you have dealt with code and sram in your lab exercises for example where you write the code here and the data here but now we are going to introduce the peripheral region because that's where i was telling that the any input output that you can think of this can be something like uh, a timer this can be something like a gpio this can be something like a serial interface this can be something like an analog to digital converter and so on whatever peripheral device you can think of will occupy a memory location in this space so basically each pin is mapped to a memory location and then the, all the microprocessor need to do is read or write from this location that's all and then we have the external ram space about 1 gb this is mostly for the external memory external ddr external flash external lcd units for example then we have external devices sd cards is what you see in a mobile phone typically right you have some space again 1 gb in this case and then there is some private peripheral bus actually this is again something like interrupts we will study about them later so they are actually occupying these regions so if you want to write something to an interrupt register this is a region where you should look at and then we have some reserved space for the system we are not allowed to actually read or write into this space and this is reserved for the system so totally 4 gb nicely divided into small small sections now i have said it many times again for a microprocessor unit or a microprocessor core this is the arrangement it looks like but physically flash will be located somewhere sram will be located somewhere and so on so they are at different physical locations but for a memory address point of view they are nicely sequentially arranged all the way from 0x000 all zeros to 0x all x so that's how it looks like moving on so important point i want to highlight just to make you comfortable each location basically each address location is only 8 bits or 1 byte long please remember that and almost all our registers are 32 bits that means four locations is what they take typically for a 32 bit register please remember that okay coming to the interfacing part of it so a typical microprocessor interfacing looks like this this are covered in class i can go a slight increase space so you have the alu plus registers over here then you have the bus interface over here and then the memory obviously is the sram probably or even external memory will be interface to the core through the bus and similarly all the interface so this is the interface part you can think of all the interface whether it is a gpio whether it is a uart uart is a particular serial protocol which we will discuss later even the timer units everything whatever peripheral that you can think of is also connected to the cpu through fs now this for a cpu looks like memory locations so your original uh, thin will be somewhere outside this is if i think this is an entire chip these are the pins of the chip so you connect the sensors or whatever thing outside but for a cpu it will write to certain memory locations which are actually specified like this and then it will reflect in the output or if it is an input it will reflect from the input to these registers so this is one thing and then more importantly uh, we know that we are constrained by space all the time right so even the ic's there is a limited number of pins that it can take so let's say a typical ic has 100 pins but then the number of accessories or number of peripherals that the microprocessor chip can support is much more than that so how to go about it and that is where the signal multiplexing or pin multiplexing is extremely important so just to make matters very simple this is an illustrative uh, picture that i am showing here so let's say the pta3 pin so this actually expands to port a so any pin belongs to a port and that naming convention actually is coming from ages old like 80s when they proposed any pin as belonging to a port so here pta means port a Three means third pin in port. So that's what the convention will follow also. So this PTA three pin, 
is actually connected to three options in this case. It can act as a GPIO, it can act as a UR, and it can as a, act as a timer, but not together at the same time. It can only act as a GPIO at one point of time. Maybe at later point of time, it can act as a UR, but what will control that? That is what this guy will do, the signal multiplexing unit. So this multiplexing unit, again, the CPU will configure that. When you say CPU configures that, you as a programmer will, programmer will configure that. So you will configure this particular pin to act as a GPIO. If it is uh, acting as a GPIO, then the UART and timers will be disabled. So you will be basically bypassing GPIO through this to this pin. Okay, so then, Last but not least, the lifeline for the entire unit is a clock. So by default, clock to any circuit in the microprocessor system is disabled. The reason for that is to save on power, right? So if you have clock, that means everything is dynamic. Some power consumption will be there, mostly the dynamic power consumption, and you want to reduce that. So how to go about it is to disable the clock. So, but without clock, you cannot work. Microprocessor is a synchronous digital logic. You need a clock to work. And so it's important that the clock is enabled before you start using it. But by default, clock is disabled. When I say clock is disabled by default, it is not for the CPU, okay? I'm talking about all the peripherals. So just to reiterate this slide, there are three aspects to it in a very high level point of view. There is a port controller. This port controller is what it decides whether how to configure your GPIO, how to configure your UART, how to configure your timer. That's what the, the role of a port controller is. When I say controller, it is again a set of memory locations or a set of registers, if you want to call that. Then you have a pin controller, which is a multiplexing control, which will select one of these options and connect that to the output or the input pin. Okay. And last not the least is the port controller where you have to enable the clock. So now let's be more focused. We'll deal about other peripherals later. Now let's focus only on general purpose input output. I'll pause for a moment here. GPIOs is one of the very, very versatile interface that is available for a microcontroller program. Because as the name suggests, it is general purpose. It can act as an input or it can act as an output. And you as a programmer can configure that. Typically speaking, a GPIO pin is a single bit input output okay so that means port a3 is a single bit okay it can only be in two states one is zero one is one okay so that's a digital state but then what about if i want to deal with eight bits then you have to consider eight such pins together okay just to give an idea so the generic def uh, definition is it is a generic pin on a chip its behavior is completely controlled by the programmer and it can act as an input or an output at a single point of time. Moving on, now we'll just see these individual components. First, we will see this uh, port control, what are the options that you have, then this multiplexing option, and of course, the so this is a typical GPIO controller, how it looks like. So you have the CPU core at this side, then you have the best interface over here, and this is your GPIO controller, okay? And then, as I said, this GPIO can act as an input or as an output, and that is actually controlled by this output buffer or the input buffer, and they are controlled by some register, which is actually a direction register. So we will start with this. The direction register, if it is one, then this output buffer will be configured or output buffer will be enabled, okay? And similarly, this is inverted, so, uh, if it is one, this guy will be enabled and this guy will be disabled. And similarly, if it is zero, this guy will be enabled and this guy will be uh, enabled. So the important aspect of this di direction register is your microprocessor will write some values to this direction register. Based on that, one of these options will be enabled. So it will either act as an output or it will act as an input. Suppose let's start with a simpler option. Suppose you are configuring the direction register such that the uh, input buffer is enabled and the output buffer is disabled. In that case, you can actually think of only this option, right? This option is disabled. So there is only one input register. So whatever value is there in the pin, it will come and sit in this register and your 
uh, CPU core can read from this register and get the values whatever the whatever is coming from the input. Okay, so let's move on. Um, if it is actually configured as an output, you have so many options, okay? You have a data output register, you have a set output register, you have a clear output register, and you have a toggle output register. So how does it differentiate? That's important to see. So the data output register, you can actually put some value there and that will actually reflect in the pin directly. And of course, you have only two options left. One is one, one is zero. And when you say register, all these registers are 32 bit. But one point of time I'm saying it is one bit and now I'm saying about 32 bits. So when I say 32 bits, they correspond to 32 pins at the output. So let's say 31 to zero is the bits that you have. 31 first bit corresponds to a 31st pin. 30th bit corresponds to a 30th pin. Similarly, zero bit corresponds to a zero pin. So you can write some value here. Let's say I'm putting one in the zeroth position. That means the pin which is actually corresponding to that zeroth bit will be high, right? That's the meaning of it. Set output register means all the bits will be set to one. That means all the output will be set to high. Clear output register means all bits will be set to zero. That means all the output will be low. Toggle output register is actually interesting. It is, as the name suggests, the toggle the status. So if the pin was already one, it will become zero. If the pin was already zero, it will become one. So just toggle the status of the pin. This is extremely useful in many cases, something like setting a flag, right? So that's, that's the beauty. So just to summarize, this is a GPIO controller. So uh, the, there are a set of four output registers, one input register and one direction register. So the mo most important guy is a direction register, which will set the direction. And if it is input, you are only worried about this input register. If it is output, you can actually work on these four options, whichever you want. Okay. So just to uh, put it in words, whatever we discussed so far, uh, GPIO, as I said, each port is 32 bits. So that means 32 pin options are available. Okay. And then to reduce the power, as I discussed earlier, all clocks are disabled. So if you want to use a GPIO, you have to enable the corresponding clock. Then each pin, uh, as I said, is having multiple options. It can act as a GPIO, it can act as something else also. So that a multiplexing option is always there. Remember that. And now they, just to uh, make it uh, not very generic, but coming back to our board, whatever we are using, the Freedom KL25EZ board from NXP, it has five GPIO ports, which is port A, port B, port C, port D, and port E. And remember, each of these ports has these six registers. So 30, and each of these uh, ports will have 32 pins also. So just to reiterate, five ports are there, port A to port E. Each port has six registers, control registers, four output registers, one input register, and one direction register. And then the each port, if you see, they are 32 bits long. Each register is 32 bits long and each bit corresponds to a pin. Okay, so that's very important. All these things become vague at this point of time, but we will have a hands-on exercise in this and then it becomes very, very clear. For you. This is the pin layout for our board, our freedom board. As you can see over here, a lot of pins are there and uh, let's take one pin and see the multiplexing option. So let's take this pin. Okay, I'm talking about only this pin. So this pin, can act as the SDA, we will study what is SDA later. It is an I2C protocol, is another S uh, serial protocol. So this pin can act as an SDA pin, or it can act as a PWM, pulse width modulation option, or it can act as port C's second pin, or it can even act as an analog pin number four for Arduino, okay? So the green values are actually directly Arduino headers. What, my, what I mean by Arduino headers is we can actually plug in an Arduino board directly on top of this. And then the analog pin number four is connected to this pin. Now, just to give an idea back whatever we were discussing. So this pin has four options. One SDA of I squared C1, one PWM, one PTC2, and one A4. So which one you will choose? That's where your pin multiplexing register will help you. You choose, let's say, port C. Then it will only act as port C. And then you have to configure that 
GPLU. That's the next option that you have. Just a bit outside of it, this whatever the black thing that you're seeing over here is the touch screen uh, interface that is there, which is built in for you. Let's take another one for uh, uh, for your uh, better understanding. Okay, let's take this pin. Okay, so this pin will act as the transmit TX transmit option in the UART. Okay, so the UART is another serial protocol which we will, we will discuss later. So this pin can act as the transmit pin of the UART, or it can act as a PWM pin again, or it can act as port A second pin. Important. Okay, port A second pin, or it can act as digital input zero for the Arduino. So four options there. Now, which one you will choose? You let's choose the port A2. In that case, you have to go and set your pin control register and disable the other three options and enable this. That's what you will do. Okay. I'll have that exercise so it becomes very clear. Don't worry about it. This is other side. So extension of the pin layout. So interesting to see that this has a built-in accelerometer and these are the pin options that you have. And this is multiplex with port E and port A. These pins are multiplex with port E. So similarly, the capacitive touch slider is connected, is hardwired to port B's 16th pin and port B's 17th pin for you. So it's already there. So if you read port B's 16th pin, so first of all, you have to configure port B as an input. And then you read this 16 bit and 17 bit those are values coming from your capacitive touch slider. Is not it interesting? Yes, it should be, right? And uh, similarly, there is a built-in RGB, red, green, blue LED for you. It's a multi-color LED for you. And that is actually multiplexed with these options as well. So port B18, port B19, and port B1, you make it as output, and then you can control these LEDs. And the same time, those pins, these port Bs18, 19, and port Bs1 are multiplexed with PWM uh, options as well. So you have to do that. So just to make it uh, very simple for you, there are many pins. So many pins are available on the board. Each pin is having multiple options. It can be a GPIO, it can be a UART, it can be I squared C, it can be timer, it can be PWM, whatever you can think of. You have the control to configure it as one of them. Moment you configure that, you can move on and configure that particular thing. Okay, so that's how we proceed. Now, let's now go a bit deeper and let's see how to configure. Step one, this is, this is something which is very interesting. This is universally true. Whatever interface that you're going to work on, step one remains same. The most important step, you actually enable the clock because by default, all clocks will be disabled, no clocks will be enabled. So you actually go and disable Sorry, enable the clock. So where will I find these registers where I can enable the clock? So in this case, I just took from the manual, I copy pasted for you. So you have to go and see this particular address location, 4048038, okay? Let me just go back. So 404, okay? So that's the location. So I'll just go back to the memory map that we have. So 404 is somewhere here, right? In this region, that is a peripheral memory map. So in this region is that register, we come back here. Okay. 4048038 is the memory location. There lies our friend. This is the name of that register. System clock gating control register five. SIM, SIM the, it stands for system integration module. And this is the register that you should be looking at. If I expand this register, this is a 32 bit register. If I expand this, it nicely pans out like this. 31st bit here, 16th bit here. 15th bit here and 0th bit here. So all these are uh, uh, default 0. You don't have any control on that. You don't have to care about that. You can ignore the bits from 31 to 16. Ignore the bits 15 and 14. Ignore the bits 8 and 7. Ignore the bits 4, 3 and 2. You only have control in these uh, bits which are 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 5 and 0. Port E is the GPIO port E port D is GPIO port D and so on. So these are the five ports available and the clocks to these five ports. So for 13, so let's go and see here. If 13, if the value here is zero, which is default, it will be disabled. So when you start the system, you can see that this register, if you see this register and see this particular uh, five bits, you can see that all will be zero at the start, which means all clocks will be disabled. 
TSI stands for touch screen interface and LPTMR stands for low power timer. So you can even enable the clocks to the touch screen interface and the low power timer by making these bits as one. But let's not go into that direction now. We will focus rather on these five locations or five bits. If you want to use them in this case, let's say port B is what I want to use. You make that bit as one, tenth bit as one, remaining I don't care about. And then you write to this register at this particular location. The moment you do that, the clock will get ended. Now, some people might be just curious to see from where I got all this information from. That, let me just quickly show you. This document I will share with you. This is the Bible for you, the reference manual for the KL25 subfamily. If you see here on the left hand side, you see all the options available to you, even memory map, clock distribution, reset, everything, all the options related to the screen. And you should actually start looking at three modules in this section, in this lecture. The first is the system integration module. So if you go there, you click there, you can see all information about clocking, everything. So you can see the register map here. So in this register map, so many registers are there. If I go and click and see this particular register, if I go and click here, it will directly take me to this particular thing. This is what I was actually showing you there. So you, everything is explained. So 31 to 20 is reserved, 19, 18, 14 is all reserved. 13th bit is 40, 12th bit is 4D and so forth. So all by default is clock disabled because the value will be zero. If you want to enable them, you write that particular bit as one, it will do. So this is your friend. You have to always come back and see in this particular document. So for example, the signal multiplexing. If you go and see here, you can see the signal multiplexing option. And then you actually just scroll down register access, uh, just scroll down to some pages there. I think it is section 11 or yeah. So just skip it through. Yeah, somewhere here, yeah, 11.5. So you can see the pin control registers option here, okay? So let's say port A is pin number zero. What are the options that you have? You see over here, so many bits again, so maybe I will explain this using the slide because it's coming anyway there, okay? So coming back to the slide, I hope you are well versed with the clock enabling part now. And now let's move on to the pin control or the pin multiplex option. So it's somewhere again here in the peripheral region, you have these registers. I was just showing you that now. So from 4004, 9000 to somewhere 4004, D0767C. These locations have this pin control register. So each bit for each port has a pin. So this is port A's first pin or zeroth pin control register. Pins control registers. Second pin also corresponds to the second bit. Always remember that. And similarly, port is 31st. So you have all the five registers, and for each of these registers, 32 options. Okay, so if you see inside what it is, this is what we were just seeing now. So if I expand that each control register, so each location, if I see that, what is the option you have? So many options are there, I don't worry about all this at this point. I only worry about these three bits. And if you go and see 10 to 8, but if you put default, it is 0, 0, 0. So these three bits are 0 default. If that is the case, it is disabled and typically it will be the analog option. For you, let's say we are studying GPIO here, so you want to configure it as GPIO, so you have to configure 001, that means 10th bit 0, 9th bit 0, 8th bit 0, you write 001 to these locations, so you cannot actually write as a bit, so you have to write the entire 32 bits, so you don't have to care about any of these 16 bits, any of these, any of these, only these three bits you have to care about, those three bits have to be 001, you make a word or rather 16 bit or 32 bit word, um, just ensuring these three are 0, 0, 001, and then write to this location, you are done. You basically configure the GPIO option. You configure this pin, pin number as a GPIO. Okay, so that's the beauty about it. I have a hands on, so you'll get better understanding. So we enable the clock, we enable the pin, or rather, enable the pin to act as a GPIO. And now we will go and configure our GPIO. That's very important, right? Because the GPIO can act as an input, it can act as an output. So you have to configure it appropriately. And if you go and see again the same region, if you see, again, you go back and see that document, 
you will see that there are certain locations which are assigned to the GPIO registers. For example, this is port A's data output register. This is port A's set output register, player output register, toggle output register, data input register, data direction register. So now we have to configure your GPIO accordingly. Let's say I want to make it as GPIO, I want to make it as an output. How shall I go about it? So I will take an example. This is an example where uh, I'm going to actually show you uh, this example live uh, so that uh, you'll get better understanding. So here I'm going to configure port B's 18th pin as an output. Okay, so that is what I'm going to do. So we will do it live instead of I'm showing it over here. I'll anyway upload this uh, uh, in the Moodle, but let's actually do it live. So I am again going to open the Keel software. I have put the code here. Um, just to explain, hope everyone can see the screen. So the initial part, I'm just trying to map the memory location accordingly. So this again, you go back and see this document. This document lists out all the address locations. So sim gsg5 is actually at this location. So I'm going to label this location as sim this one. And then I'm worried about 18th pin of port B. So I'm going to actually map this location to this uh, particular label. And similarly, the uh, control registers for that particular port. Basically, I'm interested in set output, control, I mean, player output, toggle output, and then of course the direction register. I'm not going to have a full fledged solution or answer here. I'm not going to use these uh, three options anyway, but just to give a picture of how to map, I'm just showing you power. We will be using P, GPIO, uh, B, P, D, D, R option, definitely. And then this is the code, uh, the typical one you should be very familiar with now, uh, all this stuff. This is the main part, the main code, and then it is branching to a subroutine which initializes the GPIO. So we will go uh, each one of these when I run the code. So let's actually compile this. I hope there should not be any error. Yes, uh, only one warning which we can ignore, no errors. So now let's go the debug option as usual that uh, uh, this is what uh, it happens before running. So we are there to run, but before running, you want to actually see different registers, right? Different, all the registers that uh, I was talking about so far, you're going to see it live. Okay. Obviously you're doing simulation of hardware at connected, but you can actually see the registers getting set. So before doing that, these registers, as we discussed, it is somewhere in these locations, right? 4004 and those locations. So we want to make them write enabled because I want to write to those locations. So by default, it is not uh, enabled. So just go to debug, then go to memory map. And here you can see actually what is currently mapped. So these locations are executing it during execution. It is read. During execution, it is read and write these locations and so on. But the 0x4, that is missing. So we have to actually manually add that. So I'm going to add certain locations to that. So 0x4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and to 0x, maybe I'll go all the way up to 5ff, f, 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 f. Okay. And then make sure you make it read and write. Okay, you map it and then ensure that you are actually having okay yeah i think it should be okay for i don't know maybe it is not allowing me to write till all so it's just coming there anyway it doesn't matter so it's already mapped this range whatever is needed for us and now let's close it <clears throat> okay so it is truncated to 128 mv for some reason that's okay we'll leave it and that's why it is not going all the way to 5FF. Okay. Now, now you want to see, I can see the registers over here, everything over here. I can even see any memory location I want to see. I can see over here, but that's not our interest. Our interest lies in somewhere which is actually the registers. So you just go to peripherals. Okay. So the two options here, core peripherals, we are not going to deal with at this uh, point of time the interrupt part and or the timer part. We will come back to this later, but let's see the system viewer. So you have all the peripheral options that you have. Whatever peripherals you can think of is all listed in these options here. 
okay so now let's actually uh, go and enable whichever uh, registers that you are interested in sim i am interested in so if i tick it all the sim registers will come here but i am more interested in this guy sc g uh, c5 so you can see here lp timer lock power timer touch screen interface and the port a to port e all the clocks are disabled in fact these two are access denied at this point of time but clocks you can see default it is all disabled and you have to actually programmably enable them that's what we are going to do right and the other things that you are interested in go back again to peripheral system viewer you are interested in the port and in this exercise i am only interested in port b so i just take port b and you can see port b is pin control options all the options are there i am more interested in pin control register 18 and you can actually see the options that you have in the pin control register if you are interested please go and see in that document what is is, is these options for at this point we can ignore it and uh, we are only interested in this mux option so it is all disabled if i click here you can see all the options available so to make it gpio you have to write 001 to this location you are going to do it by software again right so currently it is all zero so we have the clock option here you have the pin multiplexing option here now you want to see the gpio control register again go to system viewer and then come back to gpio and then enable gpio b Okay, because that's what you are interested in. Now you can see here, GPIO B is all options, data output, set output, and so on. Okay, everything is there. By default, everything will be zero. This means all the pins of uh, port B are zero by default. Now let's come to the business end. I'll just run it. F11 is our friend here. So this part you are very thorough with at this point of time. So you just go about it and then. You can actually come back and see. Okay, so uh, you can see over here, uh, what we are actually doing is we are loading the address uh, location, same SCG5, basically that is nothing but this particular location to R0. And then of course, getting the content of that location, basically content of this register, basically what is the current situation of this uh, uh, clock control register. So that value is actually coming to R1. And then in R2, what I'm going to do is basically loading this value. So from where I'm getting this value, that's very, very interesting because you have to go back to the system uh, uh, control, uh, system integration module, this particular register layout, if you see. So here the objective is actually to set the port B. So basically to enable the clock in this port B only to one. So for that, the rest of the things I don't care about, right? So these are all bits, 31st bit to 16 bit is, is all zero. 15 bit, 14 bit, 12, 13, 12th and 11th bit is all zero. 10th bit I will make it as one. 9th bit again zero because I don't care and remaining all I don't care, it will be all zero. So if you see, this will be zero, 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 zero in terms of hexadecimal. And then this will be zero and then basically 15 14 13 12 will make uh, 1 0 and then here 0 1 0 0 so that is 0 1 0 0 is nothing but 4 and that is why i am actually having a 4 here and remaining i don't care about so always remember this is a hexadecimal representation so 1 0 means 0 0 0 0 in terms of binary right then this 4 is coming because i want to make only port b as 1 others are 0 and that's the reason i'm going to write port b and I'm not writing this value directly to SIM because I don't want to affect which is already whatever values which is already there in SIM value. That's the reason why I'm using this OR operation. So loading whatever content which was already there to a register R1. In R2, I'm going to set the desired value. Then ORing R1 and R2, that means only the location which is actually corresponding to port B gets updated. And then moment you do that, you can store it back to this particular location. So let's see, let's see that. So I'll go to SIM. So this is all disabled. So we are already here. Okay, so we have 11. Okay, I'm here. I'm loading this value. I'm ordering the value. The moment I do this, you just notice here, the port B will get updated to enable. Beautiful, right? The clock is now enabled. Clock is up and running for port B. That's the beauty about it. Hardware is same. You are not done anything. 
you just change one software, you loaded a program, you, you actually change the bit value using program, your clock is enabled. That's beautiful, right? So that's where we are going. Now comes the next part. Now the uh, clock is enabled. Now comes the port B. Port B is actually configured default as analog and it has other options also maybe, but I want to make it as GPIO. So you have to write 001 to that particular uh, port B's 18, the, uh, this particular register, right? I mean, uh, that pin register. So where is it? Now let's go back and see the pin control register. So this is the pin that I'm interested in. 001 is the only value I'm interested in, remaining everything is zero. So this again, as usual, 31st bit is zero, up to 16th bit is zero, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, everything is zero. Only this values I put zero, zero, one, 10th bit is zero, 9th bit is zero, 8th bit is one, and that's it. So let's say zero, 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 zero for this value, hexadecimal, then zero here, and here it will be zero, 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 one. Right, that's the value I'm going. That's why it is zero, zero, one, zero. So you write this, you'll see the values changing here. So I'm again going to do it, left 11, 11, this one is done. The moment I store this, you can see actually this guy has become GPIO. So you are done the first step, clock is enabled. You have done the second step, which is actually the GPIO is enabled. And now you can go and configure your GPIO, basically the port B. So the port B is here and I need to set the direction. So direction registry is here. And here I am more interested in which pin. So I just told you something, 18th pin. So then I just need to make that 18th pin as one. So that means 18th bit as one. All bits other than 18th bit is zero, which is basically 31 to zero. All bits are zero except the 18th bit and that corresponds to a hexadecimal representation of 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 and so on. So you go ahead and do this. The moment you uh, write this, you have the value here and that means the 18th bit is configured as output and remaining, in fact, remaining all bits in port B are configured as input. Don't care about that. We are only caring about port B. So that's it. So I suggest you to actually go and uh, do this exercise. One change you can do is currently uh, in the SIM module only uh, this particular bit is enabled. Uh, you can actually enable all of them together by changing this four to something else. You try that out and let me know how it works out. Okay, so coming back, we were actually here. So this is what I explained. So I'll upload the slide anyway. You can uh, do it by your own. Now, just to wind up the lecture, uh, I just want to give some application. Okay, so you can use it GPIO typically to actually as an output to make something like a traffic light controller, you control an LED, two options are there. It can actually sync or it can actually source. Both options are given here. And uh, uh, there is a software option also. If you remember the table, I suggest you to do that as a homework. You just go back and see the pin control register and just see the pull up and pull down options that you can actually configure even using software. That's a beauty about it. Okay, then you can even combine the pins, as I said. You can combine eight pins together and then drive a seven segment LED, just like uh, you did in your digital circuits lab, where you uh, used eight pins to control, right? Similarly here, you can actually combine eight GPIO pins and drive it. And then basically, uh, so far we talked about the output option. Of course, this can act as an input. A very useful case is basically something like a photodiode. An example is shown here that can actually drive an input. So when light falls on it, the 3.3 volt get connected and this appears to be an input one. And when light uh, is not there, this will become zero. And then of course this will be zero. And that's it pretty much. So we are at the end of it. So what we discussed today is the very, uh, very basic and most powerful interface that a microprocessor unit can have, which is the general purpose input output register. This can, as the name suggests, this can act as an input and this can act as an output. Everything is controlled by you. And three aspects I would like to remember all the time. By default, to any peripheral, the clock is disabled. So as a first step, you should actually enable the clock. Second step, as we discussed, each pin can be multiplexed to many options. So you select the option that you want. In this case, we selected GPIO. In another case, you may select something else. 
but that's a second step that you should do the pin multiplexing. The third option is entirely dedicated to the thing that you're working on. Since we worked on GPIO in this lecture, we configured the GPIO. So all the registers associated with GPIO. And a holistic picture is just that a microprocessor interfaces with anything that is outside through a memory map. And this memory map is where the microprocessor will read or write to and the interface will also read or write to. And that's a link. Hope you enjoyed the lecture and I will upload the slide in Moodle and please feel free to actually uh, post your questions in the Moodle and uh, let's actually uh, meet up some, some point of time where I can even clarify your questions. Thank you for joining and have a nice day.